podcast on Saturday. <laughs> Wasn't feeling it midway through that 30 nothing run. Not were any of us really. Yeah. But we are back and, and honestly feeling, I think, pretty good about how everything turned out. Other than that game, not that game. So consider this bonus content as I get the computer fired up here. All right. It is the 200 level. <clears throat> Let's start that again. Sorry. Had a bubble in my throat. Ugh. <clears> throat> It is the 200 level, episode 408, Mike Carpenter in the basement studio. Having collected my thoughts, we are now, what, five, four or five days removed from a shellacking at the hands of UConn. Admittedly, a rough way to go out, but UConn's really good. You were really bad. UConn's really good. Two things can exist at once. But the season as a whole is what we're going to talk about today. And the 2024 Illini basketball season was in many ways, an unexpected triumph, something that I did not anticipate would go the way that it did, and something that I think for myself and maybe some other fans kind of hit the reset button on a few of our anxieties or hangups that we might have had with our Illini basketball fandom. And what I mean by that is, you know, part of our MO as Illini fans, for better or worse, mostly worse, is that we have a bit of an inferiority complex. Despite being a really good basketball program, we often assume the Murphy's Law, the worst-case scenario, is going to happen to our team. And what was especially nice about this season is while you did have moments, let's say when the news about Terrence in his case broke or the loss at Penn State, you had moments where the old Murphy's Law, I'm an Illini fan, I'm never going to have nice things, hit us like a ton of bricks. And yet this team, a really cool makeup of really easy to root for players, a head coach that was kind of up against it last year with that team in 2023, they responded every single time for the most part. I mean, this team never lost consecutive games all year. There have been teams in the past that have done that, but that is a pretty rare feat. There were no real major dips. Everything was, oh, we lost. Let's go in the next one. And they always did. So while it did end in a very anticlimactic, awful, embarrassing fashion, there's no way to sugarcoat it. I don't care how good UConn is. You shouldn't give up a 30 nothing run to an NBA team. But you did UConn. And I think they will affirm on Monday night against Purdue that they are, in fact, the best team in college basketball. It does not excuse a 30 nothing run in front of the nation. Ouch. But I don't think that that detracts from the overall success of the season in the same way that it would if it were the second round matchup, right? I think by having gotten there for a program that has been so starved for March success, for having exceeded expectations by getting there in the first place, it made that pill a little bit easier to swallow. And what I'll do here before we get to the season as a whole is talk about the process of going through that loss and then how quickly I and I think other Illini fans might have been able to turn the page. I might be speaking only for myself here, but in the second half, we started podcasting and we got about 10 minutes of actual audio podcasting, video podcasting into it. I was in my in-laws kitchen, my brother-in-law, great dude, Michigan fan, but was pulling for Illinois that game, especially love Marcus Damask and how could you not after his first half? We're watching that, and it just seems within the first two minutes, you felt like it was slipping away. And I'll be honest, I didn't feel great after the first half anyways. It felt, as Mike LaTulip had said in his podcast with Jeremy today, felt tenuous, like you were playing with fire. That, that's how I felt. You were playing with fire. They were going to start making shots, and I didn't really know what the heck we had going on offense when Klingon was out there. It got away from you so quickly that I said, you know what, guys? I'm sorry, I got to shut this off. Go enjoy the rest of your night. And, and here's the thing. 
people watching that podcast, at a certain point, there's nothing to talk about in a loss like that. What are you going to say? You're getting your butt kicked. It goes from a 10 nothing run to a 15 nothing run to a 30 nothing run. That would not have been compelling. It would have just been me bitching and moaning about the whole thing. Or sitting there silently, like a family member died, which I did have like a 10-second <laughs> blip. Like, I don't know if it was frightening for the, the people that were in there watching it, but I just kind of stopped. And I <sighs> gathered my breath and didn't say anything for like 10 seconds. And when that dead air was telling me, you know what? This might not be the day for it. I went upstairs, I wrote, and put out a column by the time the game was over because that second half was really an opportunity to decompress, recognize, hey, it's not happening today. This is the worst case scenario for this game. So does that change the way that we feel about this team? And the way I felt on Saturday was it's okay to be pissed off tonight. It's okay to think that this isn't acceptable. I did have a hunch, though, that it wouldn't take that long to be like, you know what, on the whole, that was a pretty damn good season. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, I hate that it's over, but I feel fulfilled from this team in a way that I haven't since, the, I think, the 2022 season, despite the loss to Houston. Winning that Big Ten regular season title, how could you not have been fulfilled? Right? I mean, to me, that team, in a way, somewhat overachieved. On Ken Palm, they were the 20th best team in the country. They won a Big Ten regular season title. That's impressive. This team... Top 10 all year, really good. They ran against the consensus number one Ken Palm team. And by the way, for those that are into metrics, analytics, this is the best Ken Palm team ever. This UConn team is the best Ken Palm team ever. They're better than the 05 Illini. And by the way, think about, do you think the 05 Illini would have won on Saturday? No, no. They're better than the 05 UNC team. They're better than the 06, 07 Florida teams. This is based on offensive and de defensive efficiency. They are a buzzsaw. Doesn't excuse losing by that much, but it's understandable why you lost. So I feel fulfilled, and I feel grateful that this team gave us a ride that I didn't necessarily expect, and I'm entering the offseason. We're going to have a lot of fun in April because the transfer portal is open, and there are so many fun names out there, which I don't know if we'll get to today because we'll have so many opportunities to get to it. But it really hit the reset button for me as an Illini fan where I realized, wait a second, yeah, we can win games in March. Yeah, there's not a hex on Brad Underwood coach teams that they can't win in March. Yes, we can get breaks in the bracket to aid us in making that run. And then in the case of the Iowa State game, you can win a high-level March Madness basketball game, which they did. So we're going to talk about the season as a whole. I see some folks in the YouTube feed. <clears throat> Thank you for joining me at a random time on a Wednesday afternoon, and I see that some of you have already thrown stuff in the chat window. The question YouTube feed that I asked Twitter followers today was, what, what about the season is going to be most memorable to you? Like, what's your big takeaway? What will you remember the most? And if you want to feed, uh, fill up that YouTube chat feed with that, we'll get to it. Before we get too far into this, couple things. One, we have an official website, which you're going to hear that tag at the beginning of podcasts going forward, the 200levelpod.com. We got the audio podcast, the video podcast, and I'm writing again, and I love it. I'm actually putting that journalism degree to work. So that's the 200levelpod.com. All right, got to thank DP Doe. I'm on a dpdoe.com. You were able to have three celebratory calzones. I know we wanted six. I know we did, but Weren't those three celebratory March Madness calzones so sweet? That doesn't mean you need to stop having calzones, of course. I know the tournament is over for Illinois, but your calzone eating days are not behind you, or they shouldn't be. So order online at dpdo.com. State Farm agent Brian Hansen online at brianismyguy.com. For life, auto, home, business renters, you name it, Brian is my guy and your guy as well at brianismyguy.com. Also, Dogtown Heating, Air, and Plumbing. We got to get our AC checkup. I know it's cold and Half snowing outside. Just a little bit annoying, right? But by the time we have the eclipse next Monday, it's going to be 75 and sunny. The warm temperatures are going to creep in very quickly, and you want that AC working at, at its top efficiency. And i got to give them credit. The two AC checks that they've had, our house has been as cool as it's ever been, and we got an old house. 
So that AC needs to be working tip-top. Dogtown Heating and Plumbing, give them a call at 217-841-4728. Also, got to thank Owen Builders LLC online at owenbuildersllc.com. For home additions, patios, decks, get a free quote for your next project online at owenbuildersllc.com. It's getting to be that time of year again. They, they really work year-round. Our winters aren't so bad. But if you want to think about you know getting that patio or deck fixed up in time for the summer, now is the time to get a hold of Luke and his staff at owenbuildersllc.com. All right, got to thank Champagne Showers Podcast Network. Appreciate them and appreciate you. If you're on YouTube, just be sure to give us the thumbs up and subscribe. We've really kind of started building up that subscriber base through the month of March. And that's what I want to talk about is the month of March. I don't know if I had a more fun month as an Illini basketball fan than March 2024. And, and that might seem crazy at first glance. I mean, 2001 was a great team. That was a season-long ride. Their March, they lost on Saturday in the Big Ten Tournament. They lost a heartbreaking Elite Eight game to Arizona. March, in and of itself, was not the best month for that team, right? Even though they did make an Elite Eight, but I, I would say that that success for that team, that was a five-month ride, okay? 05, same thing. That was a five-month ride. And I, I will say that despite the win against Arizona, the comeback for the ages, and beating Louisville and getting the national title game, if I look back at those first three NCAA tournament games, the shoe was on the other fr- foot in this regard. Being a one seed, being the top overall one seed, those are games you just had to win. I ask you this. Who do you think had more fun in the first three rounds of the tournament as far as fans, Purdue or Illinois? And I think the answer is Illinois this year because Purdue has a lot more to prove, and they are a team worthy of winning a national title. They're feeling that same weight that one seeds often do, especially with their loss to Fairleigh Dickinson last year. This has been a business trip. I think their first true joy and it was probably, it surpasses the joy would have, we would have felt against Iowa State. Okay, this is 44 years in the making for Purdue. When they beat Tennessee, that was a cathartic joy that is probably hard to top. But I do think those first three games, take care of business, move on. Take care of business, move on. As far as a month for Illinois basketball, March 2024 will be one I'll always remember. And I think part of it, I'm getting older, so I'm appreciating and trying to be grateful for any any memorable moments, just because that's, to me, really what sports is all about. It is You are accruing, as a fan, moments that you can talk about forever. And to be able to share all of this, not just with the podcast listeners and viewers, and we appreciate that, but to be able to share that with Isaac for most of these, after we didn't have that opportunity over COVID to do that for, let's say, the 2021 Big Ten Tournament, right? That was a great ride, but we were Zooming. (laughs) Like, that's different. In this case, the garage, my beloved garage, I love that garage. It is my new good luck charm. I don't think it would have made a difference for you, Con, if you're of the superstitious variety. But that garage, we were undefeated in the month of March, Now, we beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten Tournament when we were at Poor Brothers. Again, I'm not overly superstitious. I wasn't going to tell Kara, hey, I'm not going to Michigan for Easter because i got to be in the garage. Because how foolish would I have looked when I'm in the garage and UConn still goes on the 30 nothing run? But I'm thinking about the time spent with Isaac and the time spent with Kenton, who did an awesome job on third mic and, and one time the second mic for the Duquesne game. To have the peanut gallery of people behind us during these games. The Iowa State game, I really want to focus on that and ask yourselves this, truly, truly, other than Illinois, Arizona. And I asked my dad this. Okay, so he would remember, he mentioned on Friday morning after the Iowa State game when I texted him, the Louisville and Syracuse wins in 89. Specifically, the Syracuse win in 89. And looking back, that's a one seed versus two seed. That game was in doubt. Illinois won by three. I think, against a loaded Syracuse team, Derek Coleman on that team. Anxious times, high-level basketball game, a game that I would imagine surpassed the level of Illinois-Iowa State. But for my purposes, right, I would put that Illinois-Iowa State game up there with when Frank went off against Kentucky in 2001. I think that the 05 game against Arizona 
that's on a different level. That's in a different stratosphere. We're never going to see a comeback like that again. Period. We won't. That was an instant classic in every way, shape, and form. But what was really cool about this, being almost 20 years removed from the 05 run, and I said this about five or six times in the second half, I said, this is fun. (laughs) We're in a high-level game. The whole nation is watching. Two versus three, you led the whole way. You weren't even at your best, but you were tough. And that experience, sharing it on the mics with Isaac, with Kenton, with the peanut gallery, and the video which got over 10,000 views on Twitter of when Terrence got the steal and slam. And I let out a yell that Isaac, rightfully, compared to Tom from Tom and Jerry, his yell, which is always kind of a weird animated voice thing. But if you know Tom and Jerry and you know Tom, when he yells, if he gets his tail stepped on or any pain is inflicted on him, that was the sound I made when Terrence dunked it. That game was the culmination of a fan-freaking-tastic month, which began on March 1st against Wisconsin, where you were just the better team and you beat Wisconsin yet again. This is the norm under Brad Underwood now. There was the hiccup at home against Purdue where you played tough. You just didn't make enough shots. And Terrence didn't quite show up, and unfortunately that reared its head again against UConn. But then you go to Iowa, take a big early lead, a little bit of a dip in the middle, but the last 10 minutes you stepped on their throats again. You go to the Big Ten tournament. You fall behind double digits in all three games, and you win all three games en route to another banner, the third banner that a Brad Underwood team has been able to raise. And other than an eh, iffy first half against Moorhead State, you then play five really good halves of basketball in a row when it mattered the most. You made an Elite Eight, and that Iowa State game, that was the culmination of this great wave that we were able to ride as fans that we had not been able to ride for a long time. To me, March 2024 was the great reset. It was a reminder that, yes, Illinois can win in March. Illinois is, and we already kind of knew this, but top-tier Big Ten team and will be for the foreseeable future. In this NIL climate, we'll talk plenty transfer portal this month, would you want anyone other than Brad Underwood right now? And I say that even knowing what Matt Painter has done with this Purdue team. No, this month got so much weight off. I feel so much lighter. I don't know about you. I feel so much lighter as an Illinois basketball fan. I thought the regular season title in 22 that that would do it alone. It didn't. In 21, that loss against Loyola just loomed too large. I got to be honest. This doesn't erase the Loyola loss, but at least get some of the stink out of here, at least a little bit. I think the Loyola loss, it, it was more than just losing that game and losing an opportunity for that team to make a deep run. That's bad enough. I think it was the fact that the, the narrative of your head coach not being able to win in March had persisted until now. And yeah, I thought Brad Underwood coached pretty poorly against UConn. Brad Underwood is not a perfect coach. I think that while he is flexible in the macro sense, in games he can take too long to make that adjustment. And when he sent out the same starting five to start the second half against UConn, and I know that was his MO all year, but the writing was on the wall. That five was not going to work. Quincy and Ty, no. That wasn't working that day. And then waiting until late in the first half to maybe not attack Klingon that much? It, it, it was a bad coaching night. It just was at the worst time. Now, granted, I don't know if even his best coaching night would have been enough. I don't know if Illinois' best shooting night would have been enough. You wouldn't need an A-plus game in hindsight, which is always twenty twenty. But he's still our guy. And, and if anything, I came into the season really more focused on Brad Underwood than any player, any particular game. This was going to be a season where Brad Underwood was going to reclaim his program and put his stamp on it and not let the lunatics like a Matthew Meyer or a Jaden Epps or a Sky Clark, don't let them run the asylum. Don't even let it become an asylum. Get control of your program. And he did. But there was something more in this March run that really resonated with me. There was a positivity emanating from that team. There was fun. 
there was acknowledging the fun of winning. Yes, the squirt guns. Yeah, the, the musical chairs or pushing the chairs back in, that little shtick. The team was having fun, and it's sports, for God's sakes. It should be fun. And it was such a great reset for me in that way. How many times, as an Illini fan, have I, and maybe you as well, carried the weight of the world on our shoulders because of past disappointments? You know, the joy of victory will always live longer than the agony of defeat. It just will. If you were to ask an Illinois fan, well, you see, I say that. I don't remember the Sean Higgins thing. But I do the Sean Higgins put back in 89. But I do remember in 05, James Augustine fouling out in about, what, six minutes of game time? And I remember being at the assembly hall and walking out of there, and everyone just was depressed. And that sucked. I remember the Arizona win more. And maybe that's selective memory. Maybe that's me just parsing out what I don't want to remember. But no, I remember the Arizona game more than the national title game. I remember the Iowa State game more, play by play, how that second half unfolded, the plays that really made a difference. I remember that a hell of a lot more than I will Loyola and certainly UConn. So this team reminded us, and reminded me at least, I can't speak for everybody, it should be fun. Listen, if you listen or watch the podcast, you know that I can be overly serious. The fanboy cart moniker started off tongue-in-cheek, but... I acknowledge, as fanboy carp, I ride the wave and emotions can get the best of me. I, I can be the most, attempt to be the most logical fan in the world. It doesn't matter. Fandom is not logical. Fandom is emotional. And what this team said is, hey, fans, have some fun with us. Have some freaking fun. And I did. It was an awesome month on top of what was a really good season. You know, we were waiting for that signature win, right? We, we got all the way through February wondering, what is our signature win? Is it Florida Atlantic? Eh, they, they were whatever towards the end of the year. <clears throat> Michigan State at home? Okay, I don't know. I, we didn't really have a signature win. We just had a lot of wins, and that's, that means a lot. You had a signature month. You had a signature month that I think set up your program beautifully got you a, a tangible thing that you can hang in the rafters with a Big Ten tournament title, and it got that stupid March Madness monkey off of your back. That doesn't mean Illinois might not have a disappointing first or second round exit next year. They might. That's the tournament. That's just the way it is. Uh, <laughs> there's never any guarantees, but just keep getting bites at the apple. One final thing before I get to some of the listener feedback and, and, and what you are typing in the YouTube feed, so thank you for your patience. A national championship is the ultimate goal. We know that. That would be catharsis beyond measure. I did think, you know, part of the reason why the UConn shellacking was initially such a gut punch was the feeling that if you got past that game, you weren't facing any team like UConn. Like, if you can beat UConn, you can win a national title. So when you had it tied at 23, I thought, well, what the hell? This is not the game I was expecting in terms of the style. But, man, if you can just keep counterpunching, keep hanging in there, why not? Well, we know why not. You were bad. They were very, very good. And they are very, very good. But the national title, that's the big kahuna. I may or may not see that in my life, but I would so badly love to see it. Brad Underwood is in year seven at Illinois. Year 11 overall as a head coach. And I think I saw someone tweet out about this. Take Bill Self, for example. It took him 15, 16 years as a head coach to finally get that elusive national title. Right? It took him that long to get there. And, and you can go down the list. The Tom Izzo's of the world that got their national title in year three or four, that's, that's pretty rare. It takes time. What I am looking forward to with Brad Underwood at the helm, and I hope it's for a while longer because I admit it. I mean, last week I wrote about this. This season was validation for Brad Underwood. I thought this season, despite in-game missteps, was his masterpiece at Illinois. I, I'm looking forward to seeing a guy that continues to learn as a head coach, and I think he is. 
I think overall the adaptability is there, the flexibility is there, and the willingness to work within this new college basketball landscape to maximize it the best you can. And learning how to identify guys that fit, how to get them quickly, what not to do, like get strung along by an RJ, Ray J. Dennis, right? Don't, don't let that happen again. And don't always go for the shiny thing like a Matthew Meyer. I was excited. We were all excited. He was probably excited. But, you know, you got to identify both on-court and off-court fits. And I think that this season was a big step in the right direction. Doesn't mean he's not going to strike out occasionally and bring in a guy that's a problem in the locker room or a guy that just kind of disrupts the chemistry of the team. That probably will happen if he coaches here long enough again. But I just look forward to him continuing to evolve and perfect his craft. And I do think that coupled with his ability to coach in this landscape, his ability to recruit at a high level with high school and identify those two guys a year that can be your mainstays. And now finally the culture they kept talking about everyday guys, everyday guys. I used to sort of roll my eyes even with good Illinois seasons because they could be so oddly inconsistent Beyond what you would even expect from a good college basketball team. Yes, they're college kids. Inconsistency is probably going to happen. It just felt like the lows, even in good seasons, the lows were really precipitously low. Everyday guys, they were not always, right? And they certainly weren't even against UConn. But not losing consecutive games all year, that, that's an everyday guy kind of thing. If you want to go with that mantra, not losing consecutive games for an entire basketball season is pretty damn impressive. One more thing, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to give credit to Trevor for this. In terms of expectations and what this team accomplished, and then I got the YouTube chat feed, and thank you for your patience again, guys. I got some Twitter responses before we get out of here. We were texting on either Saturday night or Sunday, maybe after the dust had settled, and I thought Trevor just contextualized this perfectly. Illinois finishes 10th in Ken Palm. They finish 10th in the AP poll, I think. They finished something like 11th in Bart Torvik, 11th in the net. They were between 10 and 12 in all these different rankings and metric systems. And we reflected on how this season was a lot like that Denny Green quote after the Bears won that Monday night game against Arizona back in 2006. They are who we thought they were. This Illinois team was about the 10th best team in the country. All year. Yeah, there were some dips. You got down to like 14 in the AP poll. You got as high as 10. It all leveled out at the end when you had that really big march and that run of the Big Ten tournament title. But this team was what we thought they were. Once they figured out, let's say starting at Rutgers on December 2nd, that to me was a turning point of the season where they started to figure out their identity offensively. And then at least for a while defensively, and I think the defense returned when it mattered the most. Okay, I, UConn aside. I thought the defense matched that offense's intensity for much of the end of the season, much of March. Yeah, from December 1st on, this was a top-10 team. They just were. And, of course, if you get certain breaks, top-10 teams can make runs to the Final Four. They can make runs to the National Championship game. You got in UConn's bracket. You didn't get the benefit of, let's say, a, an Alabama facing a Clemson. A tough Clemson team, albeit. But you didn't get that break. You didn't get the break of facing NC State in the Elite Eight. And I know that's an amazing story, but would Illinois beat NC State? I think. I think they would have. Because I don't think Duke was necessarily all that great. I think they would have beat Duke for sure. So all that to say, I'm not complaining because you got the break with Duquesne winning. I thought you got a really good matchup against the number two by facing an Iowa State, it just so happens that the break did not extend all the way to the Elite Eight. You got the number one team in the tournament, one of the best college basketball teams in the last 20 years. So that, were, that consistency, I, I don't know what more you can ask for as a fan. You know, uh, frustrations within games, guess what? I'm going to have it again next year and the year after that and the year after that. Every time I do a second half podcast, if I see another collapse like Penn State, I'm going to be pissed off. I'm going to be criticizing Brad Underwood for this, that, or the other that he did not do to win that game. That's fandom. But just for the record, I'm very, very happy 
with the state of Illinois basketball. It's hard not to be. In fact, it would be, I think, illogical or not based in objective truth to look at the current state of Illinois basketball and say anything but, you know what? It's pretty damn good because that's what it is. It's pretty damn good. And we're in a great spot going forward, it feels like. The last month of basketball only helped that case. Positive carp. You're getting positive carp today, but you know what? That was me through the month of March with just a couple of rare exceptions. Um, yeah. I haven't worn Alani stuff since that loss on Saturday. Not out of, like, protest or anything like that. you got to let the dust settle a little bit. But, no, I, I'm, I'm proud to be an Illini fan. I'm proud to be an alum. I, I'm getting my master's from there. I got all these kind of tentacles at being a townie. All these tentacles that touch the University of Illinois and the basketball program has been, since the age of consciousness for, for me, the biggest constant with the university. More than any class I took, more than any friends I met because I wouldn't have met them until I was 18. No, Illinois basketball goes back for me when I was three, four years old. My master's graduation party is going to be decked out in orange and blue crap. I love the color orange. <laughs> it's garish and loud and ugly, and Illinois fans certainly can be all three of those things. But I'm an Illini fan, too. I can be an asshole because this is my team, and I love it. And even when they aren't good, I'm still going to watch them, and I might complain about them, but I, I want nothing more than them to win, right? And I think that goes for all of us. And it was just a refreshing year and a refreshing March and just a great reminder to me. It's sports. Take a breath and enjoy the wins. Thank God they did. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to crap on Purdue here. They, when they won those first three games, they were very businesslike. And you know what? Illinois in 05 was the same thing. Bruce Weber, and this would be a crazy image anyways, but imagine Bruce Weber coming in the locker room shirtless and dowsing the 05 team with a super soaker. Hard to picture. Same with Matt Painter. I can't picture him doing that. I'm okay with our team being the one that has fun. We could be a one seed. I bet Brad Underwood would be doing the same thing. And I wouldn't fall. You know what I need to be sure of? And please hold me to account for this if I tweet or say anything to the contrary. And I don't think I've ever really been one of these types of sports observers that says, oh, look at them on the bench. Why are they smiling? They're down five. Or, you know, there's fans that do that, and understandably sometimes, because they're pissed off that their team is losing. How dare the players aren't as miserable as they are? Let's take that to the next level. I never want to bemoan a team of 18 to 22-year-old guys having fun when they win. And as a 37-year-old, I look at that, it's contagious. And it's just such a good reminder. Just have fun. Enjoy the moment. I enjoyed every bit of March. Iowa State, I keep going back to it. I, I am over the I've, I've watched that clip of me and Isaac and Kenton and my friends and some friends' parents were off camera. They're sitting in their fold-out chairs and probably just like, oh, my dear God, look at these hooligans. All-time cathartically joyous moment in my life. If that's ridiculous, I understand. It's sports. But think about it. When Terrence got the steal and slam, was that not one of the most cathartically awesome moments you've had as an Illini basketball fan? You were already in the Sweet 16, but this was taking it to a really serious step. You were beating a really good team now. This was not luck of the draw, Duquesne. This was a two-seed Iowa State team. To wrap it up like that with panache and to just ah, rid yourself of the albatross even more. Take a breath. I am so much lighter. The concrete vest of past disappointments, gone. And there's still work to be done, right? Still Final Fours and National Championships. The ride's going to continue. We'll get more cracks at it. And hopefully we break through with that as well. Listen to Mailbag. Well, first off, YouTube, you've been so patient. I just keep yapping. But I'm so happy. Yeah, we aren't even playing this weekend, and I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. All right, let me just get to the YouTube chat feed real quick. And again, thank you for those tuning in randomly. 
on a early Wednesday evening. All right, here we go. <clears throat> From Eric. Hey, Carp, what a season. Go Illini. Um, it was, I mean, let's keep it simple, Eric. Yeah, what a season. We'll start with that. Eric does continue here. My best memory, the Sweet 16 game against Iowa State, and your reactions in the garage right after the game, what a feeling that was. Eric, I had a bottle of Basil Hayden uh, under the table. Or no, I'm sorry, it was behind me. Basil Hayden, great bourbon whiskey, my favorite sip in whiskey. We, we polished off that bottle. There wasn't much left. But my inclination, the buzzer sounded to go back. I got to take a pull from it. I got to take a pull from my favorite sip and whiskey. Lit up a cigar <laughs> after all my friends left. My friend left a black and mild, which is a cigarillo. And I've always loved the smell of a black and mild. I'm like, you know what? I'm white mad up too. I wake up Friday morning. We're, we're driving to Michigan. And fortunately, Kara is driving to Michigan. I get a sit and just sip on my coffee. And I wrote my column. You know, I... I a little bit hungover, not going to lie. Not bad, but just that tinge. It was a lack of sleep because I think I got four hours of sleep, maybe. And it was the whiskey and the cigar and the black and mild at the end of the night. But you know what? It was totally worth it. I'm sitting in the garage after things have wound down. I put almost everything up. I got a bowl of Tostito scoops that someone brought over and a thing of queso, and I'm just noshing on these things with my nightcap <laughs> blissfully happy blissfully happy the next morning we wake up and what we did differently for this game because i knew it was late and we have some neighbors that I, I i would guess are not into illinois sports let's just say i don't think they're watching the podcast right now and the late start meant okay we are going to react in the garage there's no way to not react so i get home from school and i'm trying to Bojangle the Wi-Fi system here so I can have the garage door shut and still get enough service. And you can even look at that video. It gets fuzzy at parts because I just wasn't getting great service. Got enough for the TV. That was never an issue. But I know that sometimes the video feed was spotty. And even with the garage door shut, and it's a big brick detached garage that we have, we wake up in the morning and, and Kara's like, well... You guys had a hell of a time last night, didn't you? And I was like, oh, yeah. She's like, well, that's pretty cool. My bliss rubbed off on the Spartan fan that is my wife. She was like, that's awesome. She wore her Illinois sweatshirt on the way up to Michigan. I see my, my in-law family and awesome people, and they're congratulating me. And we're sitting at the dinner table. The four hours of sleep is weighing on me. My eyes are heavy. I crashed early I don't think I made it even through uh, I made it through maybe the first half of the second game on Friday but Friday just being able to I always have said one of the best parts of winning in the tournament is the glow afterwards getting the sweet 16 you get five days to just be happy winning the elite eight or winning that sweet 16 game you get a full day before the next game to be like we're in the elite eight yeah we didn't get to that mountaintop that I've only experienced once I was too young to remember 89. But that week between the Elite Eight and Final Four in 05, six days of bliss. A full week because we won on a Saturday and didn't play again until Saturday. A full week. We'll get there sometime, I would assume. I hope. Fingers crossed. No guarantee. I know. But, yeah, to be able to feel that again. Just blissfully happy, Eric. And uh, that Iowa State game, I'm going to hold in high esteem as long as I am an Illini fan. From Justin. I want to talk Justin. I'm going to get some water here real quick. Ah, here we go. Dead air. Isn't it great podcasting? Again, I, I had far worse dead air for the UConn game. Justin says, I love random times. Oh, for the podcast. Thanks, Justin. The emergence of Dane Danger in the tournament was awesome. The Terrence come back from extended time off and the unmasking of Damask. All those things were awesome. Dane, I'm glad you mentioned Dane, Justin. I hadn't yet because I was doing more macro season in review. Guy will always have a place in Illini history. Just super likable. Fan favorite for good reason. Positive guy. Seems like a very kind of thoughtful dude. Whenever you listen to him in the press conferences, kind of soft-spoken. Chill guy. I, I, I would get along well with Dane. I'd like to pick his brain about life because I just feel like Dane's got his head on straight. What a run he had. 
you know, and I, I wish him the best, and it does make sense because he was either going to be a starter or bust. And if that's not the offensive system you want to run for 25, 30 minutes a game, then he should be able to go out and get his. That's the current landscape, as sad as it is. I also think it's about as amicable, amicable as it could be. So, Dane, thank you. And, you know, I bet he makes the occasional trip back to Champaign. And imagine the ovation he's going to get. From day one, the guy was a fan favorite. Through all the struggles this year, still a fan favorite. And what a march for him. You don't achieve the success you did with a Big Ten tournament title and a lead eight run without Dane Danger. That's a legacy. That is a legacy right there. This is from Nick. I'm 27. I vividly remember 2005. I grew up watching a lot of bad basketball. This team I would consider my team, my generation's team. They will be remembered very positively. Thanks for all you do, Carp. Well, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. And you're 10 years younger than me. So, let's see, I was a senior in high school in 05. That means you would have been third grade or something, like eight years old. And you would have been too young to remember 01. That would have been like what 89 was for me, just too young to remember it. So, yeah, I understand why if I was, if I had a great team at eight and I had a great team at 27, the one at 27 is going to resonate more with me. You know, I'm, I feel so lucky to have been the age that I was from 98 to 06, which was just an, a crazy good run, right? That would have been for me from age 12 through 19. When you live and die by every game. I mean, just you are as into it as you could be. If they lose, you're throwing things. I did that often. If they win, you are just just complete joy, right? And I, I still like that I can feel the joy without putting holes in the wall at this age. So that's positive steps, Carp. Way to, way to be an adult. But I, I can see why, Nick, that this team would be your team. You know? Uh <laughs> They were a likable team. You know, I, I have a story coming out tomorrow about Terrence and the complicated legacy that's kind of, con- it not kind of, it is contingent on what happens with his court case in May. From a basketball perspective, I had as much fun watching Terrence as I have almost any line I play. It was pure dominance for extended stretches. Marcus Damask, yeah, sometimes untimely turnovers, but not really when it counted, if you think about it. Big Ten tournament, I think he had five turnovers against Wisconsin, but you were able to withstand that. But down the stretch, when games matter the most, he wasn't turning the ball over, and he was super consistent. Even uh, apart from the Ohio State game in the first round of the Big Ten tournament, he was awesome. And just just a chill dude, kind of like a junkyard dog with just, he doesn't have to bark. You know, he, he just does it. What What is the old adage? I'm using a bunch of cliches now, but the old speak softly and carry a big stick. That's Marcus Damask. That's him, right? Coleman, to me, in terms of Nick, of, uh, and Nick, if you're still here, I'd wonder what your take is on this. What does Coleman mean for you, the 27-year-old Illini fan? I don't want to gloss over this. Coleman Hawkins spent four years here, and I guess there's an outside shot he could come back for a fifth. I mean, he can come back for a fifth, if he decides the pros aren't for him yet. He said after the game he wants to go to the pros. I don't begrudge him at all if that's what he ends up doing. But you're 27, Nick. Four years of Coleman Hawkins. This guy wins three banners. Yeah, he was a bit player, if that, his freshman year. There was too much talent in front of him. To me, you know, this is someone that used to drive me nuts. Even at the end of the Penn State game, still had the ability to drive you nuts. But I tell you what, in the Big Ten tournament, I know he didn't light up the stat sheet. He was pretty good in two of those games. And then at the end of the Ohio State game, he was rough for the first 30 minutes. But man, his defense and rebounding helped you win that Ohio State game. Great in Nebraska, great against Wisconsin. I thought fantastic in the Iowa State game. Again, box score. Not necessarily gaudy numbers, but I think he finished 12, 7, and 6 in two steals. And the steal that almost was after Terrence's dunk, which is one of the most hilarious but appropriate gifts for Coleman Hawkins. Yeah, he's just this sort of, he's one of a kind. He really is. And he is a guy that whenever he comes back to the State Farm Center will get an ovation and a half, and he deserves every bit of it. 
and I say that as someone that used to be driven crazy by Coleman. But at the end of the day, he drove the opponents a lot more crazy than he ever drove me crazy. That's the mark of a really good basketball player. And by all accounts, listening to his press conferences and, and what his teammates think of him, a cool dude. Very thoughtful. I, I appreciate Coleman for that. Eric had a few more here. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Eric just kind of responding to my, my anecdote about the Iowa State game. Before I get out of here, here are the responses on Twitter. So the question I asked Alani fans for the listener mailbag was, what will you remember most about this team? From Jacob, this is a fun year, no doubt. I'll remember the Big Ten title run and that Sweet 16 game against Iowa State. Shannon dunk to seal was a moment to remember. If we're in a different region, we'd have a Final Four banner, but that's about the only thing I can gripe about. Maybe next year. Yeah, Jacob, I, I mentioned that. You got the break with Duquesne. I think as far as two seeds go, you did get a break with Iowa State. I think we saw in that game their limited playmaking on offense allowed you to overcome an off day offensively. 72 points against them is still pretty impressive, but you had to work for it. They didn't have the playmakers to match yours. That, that's pretty much it, right? So in that way, Jacob, would I have taken them over a Tennessee? You bet. I would have definitely taken a te uh, Iowa State over a Tennessee in that matchup. Marquette, I would have taken Marquette again. Probably would have taken them over Iowa State. I, I, I don't think that that early season game against Marquette was indicative of where those teams were at the end of the year. Who was the other two seed? God. Um, Tennessee was in Purdue's region. Oh, Arizona. Uh, I guess I would have taken them too. So, yeah, Jacob, it, it's interesting. After UConn and Purdue, total crapshoot, right? I think Iowa State was an okay matchup for us. So I, I, I want to say overall, you the breaks in the tournament, it evened out. Yeah, you got the buzzsaw of UConn, but you got Duquesne in the second round. So that's the way the cookie crumbled this year. From Casey, the fight and resiliency of this squad. To imagine what they all had to go through with the off-court stuff, adjusting with Terrence out, and then his return, and yet still winning at Maryland, at Wisconsin, at Iowa, with nothing to play for. That's a good point there, Casey. They had no... What was their motivation at Iowa? Knock Iowa off the bubble, I guess. But, yeah, I, I remember thinking, I think we're just better than Iowa, so we don't need the extra motivation. But they kind of kicked their butt when Iowa needed it. Casey continues, winning three very different ways on the path to a Big Ten tournament crown. Winning three very different ways on the way to the lead eight, with a heavy dose of Shannon in all of them. The dedication of Danger, DGL, Goody, to all continue to fight for their spot and come through in big moments. This squad was special. Didn't even mention Coleman's sense of humor to keep this team loose through it all, which I'm sure was extremely important. Memories are endless. And on a personal note, it rekindled my excitement in this program. Good things ahead. ILL. Casey, I appreciate it. Always love hearing from you. Um, you know, not just a baseball aficionado. This guy knows all sports, and he's an Illini fan through and through. And I agree with you, Casey, that that to me is the big thing. It rekindled some joy that I had been either – uh, tapping in or just not, uh, not, not tapping into enough, I should say. It loosened me up. And credit to this team. I, I, think, I, I don't think I'm the only one. I think it just reaffirmed the program is in a good place. We don't have these ghosts or demons out to get Illinois basketball. Sometimes you get breaks, sometimes you don't. This team made some of their own breaks. They took advantage of others. And they were really fun, and they were really exciting, and they were really good. And also, to your point, Casey, the resiliency that we have talked about a little bit, but the resiliency through the off-court stuff, and again, our article tomorrow coming out about Terrence and, and just kind of reconciling the fan aspect of the Terrence saga, but also the resiliency through those three Big Ten tournament games and three wins in the NCAA tournament, all of them very different from the one before it. They were experts in March at finding ways to win most of those games. The exceptions the two teams that will be in the national title game. There you go. Ethan, I'm trying my best to remember 23-23 instead of 30 to nothing. That's fair, Ethan. That was rough. It was a great season. The bus saw we ran into at the end hurt a lot. All that said, I'm going to remember Marcus Damas coming out of nowhere and being a star, Coleman being the best version of Trollman Hawkins online, TJ being an absolute unit, and PV Scott, 59, calling out Quincy for being cute. Um, I will admit, uh, I think Patty is your first name. Quincy's a, an attractive fella. He is. This was an all-time great team, continues Ethan. I will always, I hope I always remember that. You will, Ethan. 
They were they were a great team. You know, and here's the thing: if we're doing tiers, there to me, all time really it varies by fan. This to me is an objectively great team. Third most wins in program history, Elite Eight trip. You know, whether or not they're as good, they aren't as good as 05 and they aren't as good as 89, and that's okay. I think what if they're all time for you, that's great. And I, I don't know why I'm having that hiccup with that with those semantics. Maybe it's because I think that there's still better yet to come. And that this team, I mean, are we ever gonna look back and say, how did he win all those games with Quincy and, and Justin Harmon kind of disappearing? And listen, Quincy had some okay games down the stretch, but he was not the Quincy that we saw in the first couple months. Justin Harmon didn't hit a three for the last two months. How did you do that with two of your three transfers kind of fading? One of them big time and one of them just kind of fading. Well, the answer to that, as mentioned earlier, was Luke Goody and his emergence at the end of the year. I'd love Luke to come back. And I don't know what his plans are. I don't know if it's continue playing basketball at all. But Luke coming back, he was awesome in March. And we already talked about Dame. So that kind of offset the the decrease in production from Quincy and Justin was offset by Luke and Dame. And you had Terrence, and you had Marcus, and you had Coleman Hawkins. So that's a really good team. I just feel like, Ethan, that every now and then, just sort of like the 2022 team, I know you had Kofi, and you had Trent, and you had Alfonso Plummer. But after that, you just had some guys. Like, DeMonte was a tough guy, but not an elite talent. So I felt like the 2022 team kind of exceeded expectations. I feel like this team exceeded expectations. They had a couple of elite dudes offensively and a Swiss Army knife in Coleman, but those three were really the givens. And then you just had to go on a game-by-game basis with other people. So all time remains to be seen, I think. But for me objectively great. I mean, there's no, I would not use a word other than great. I can't say merely good. Come on. They won 29 freaking games. That's, that's just objectively great from Justin. I remember how the team stuck together despite what looked like a special season going down the drain after the TSJ news. And then finally wiped away our second weekend anxieties with a fun filled final month. Well, outside the UConn second half. Thanks, Justin. A little bit more water here for the last couple from Teddy. The fun this group had together, the chair moving, Twitter talking, TikTok trolling, seeing this team being Brad out of his shell. It was obvious the camaraderie he had with them. TSJ, all of them, both the great on court and the bad, the off court situation. Yeah, we'll we'll see how that plays out, Teddy. Damask, first team all Big Ten. Teddy mentions that as well. I, I saw a TikTok video from Coleman. I'm not on TikTok, but one of my friends got the video from it. And there were, I think it was before the Sweet 16 game. And there, there are these filters online where you can like put it on a friend's face and it will give them makeup or something like that. So they were playing cards and he had this female makeup filter. So you see Marcus Damask and all of a sudden he's got eyeliner and blush and lipstick. And then Luke Goody did the same thing and Justin Harmon too. And it's like, this is the same stupid crap me and my friends do. Like, it it would not have shocked me at all if this team engaged in rousing renditions of D's Nuts, which my friends and I still play D's Nuts to this day. If one of my own students said D's Nuts, I, I just, it's not in me to write them up because it's just a classic game of completely stupid humor. So, <laughs> it would not surprise me if this team would have done the same thing. We watch these games, and we get to feel like we know them to an extent, but now in the social media age, even more so. So those little behind-the-scenes things that you were talking about, Teddy, they they did add to the fun. They seem like a group that just genuinely enjoyed each other. That's all they ever said, the players and coaches alike. I'll take them at their word for that because it did seem to kind of rub off on the fan base. I mean, I really do think that this team, if we want to go all-time great, we can't say that in terms of making a Final Four the big kahuna of a national championship. But I do think there was an intangible quality that this team had that lightened the mood around this program that had some heaviness with it that you could argue is is super important in some in some ways just as important as a big win might be. Uh, I, I, I can see that argument being made. This is from Banana Champagne, just a couple more here. 
that we saw true leadership on this team in both on the court, Damascus and TSJ, and off the court, Hawkins and Goody. This team seemed more like a family and looked like they were happy. Thanks, Banana. Just love the name. I love, I love being able to just say Banana Champagne. From Tip McNown, Shannon is the best scorer I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue. The Big Ten tournament run of double-digit comebacks, the grindy Iowa State Sweet 16 game. Excellent. And one more from Jalen Glows. I remember how connected the guys were both on and off the court. The TSJ performances in the Big Ten tournament and Big Ten tournament championship, of course. I remember getting over the hump to the Sweet 16 and then, of course, to the Elite Eight. TSJ's dunks, uh, they were a beautiful side, Jalen Glows, and Marcus Damas' booty ball. I appreciate the responses in there. Yeah. Um, one more here. This is from Nick. I'd asked him, and he's still in the thread, about Coleman Hawkins. And Nick says, I had my frustrations with Coleman, but he will go down as a fan favorite for me for sure. I wouldn't say he's IO to me, but he's up there. In his own way, Nick, yeah. He's a four-year dude that was super impactful, and I think we grew to appreciate those eccentricities, of which there are many with Coleman Hawkins. One more here from Your Right. Hey, Your Right. This year's team is a lot like those early 2000s teams with Frank Williams and crew. I think ultimately you're right. Uh, you know, 2001 is the best team I've ever seen to not make a Final Four. It was crushing and in a way still is because that was a team that could have won the national title. And that that's not hyperbole. And I don't know about this team in a climate where a UConn and, and a Purdue exists and you'd already lost Purdue twice. Maybe you give them the third time, I don't know. But they, they just, on the whole, were better than you. So it would have taken your best shot. That Illinois team in 01, the way they were playing, I feel like had they gotten past Arizona, they could have done it. They could have. Can't say shoulda, but I think there was a better chance of that team winning a national title than this one. However, to your point, you're right. I do think that in the annals of Illini basketball history, you know, 84 and 2001 as Elite Eight teams, there was a crushing disappointment that they didn't make it to the Final Four because both of those were legit national title contenders. I never got that sense of this team, but I thought, what the hell? Let's get our shot against UConn. From the moment those brackets came out, and I, I bet it's on Poor Brothers podcast, when they came out, just give me a shot at UConn. What the hell? You play them 10 times, maybe you win three. Let me amend that. You play them 10 times, maybe you win two. I don't know. I think you get at least one. But yeah. point being, I just wanted a shot. In 01, I thought this team's making a Final Four. In 84, I think most Illini fans thought, Kentucky or not, this team is making a Final Four. So I guess we'll close with this. It's arbitrary, but I'll, I'll rank Okay, in my life, 05 is the best team that I can remember. I understand the argument for 89. Well, I'll go back even before I was around just because of some kind of institutional knowledge of how fans view these teams. I would imagine, and if you have any disagreement, tweet at Fanboy Carp. The 05 and 89 teams are 1A and 1B, and the mileage may vary based on how old you were when those teams were around. Okay, so if we say 0589 or 8905, we know what 1A and 1B are going to be. From there, I would imagine that you have 2A and 2B with 2001 and 1984. To me, those two seasons mirrored each other quite a bit. Really tough physical teams that just ran into a bit of bad luck and really good teams in the Elite Eight. Arizona got the benefit of calls, but you know what? That Arizona team was freaking good in 01. They were loaded. The Kentucky team in 84, I don't remember any names on them. Too young, again, wasn't even born. But it was at Kentucky. They were a one seed. I'm guessing they were loaded too. Those two teams were capable of winning national title. Didn't even get a bite of the apple. I will say this, and this is where postseason success does matter. This team, I'll remember more fondly than 2021. You might say, well, hold on a second. What team was better? Well, Maybe 2021. That team still finished fourth in Ken Palm, right? Iowa was incredible. And Kofi was Kofi. And Andre Crabella was on a heater at the end of the year. And Adam Miller was a pretty good freshman. And now he's in, you can follow him in the where they now file. What a weird career he's had. But whether or not the 24 team is better than 21, all I know is at the end of the 2024 season, unlike 2021, I am satisfied. I am fulfilled. I feel like that team maxed out their potential. I did not feel that way with 2021. A team that, mind you, started 9-5. and five. They had some dips. 
They had a crazy hot February and a really good Big Ten to get that one seed. But, yeah, this team is vaulted ahead of 21 for me. And 22 with the Big Ten regular season title, I thought that was a lot of fun as well because that team, again, I felt maximized what they had. I think Brad Underwood has truly maximized two of the last three seasons uh, with the talent that he had and, and getting them as far as he possibly could. So as we end today's podcast, putting the bow on, wrapping the bow in the 2024 season, what fun. Transfer portal time. You know the names. Come on. There's AJ Store. There's the Maddox and the Hill. Two guards. Maddox is at Toledo and Marcus Hill. I want to say Bowling Green. You got the center, Raynaud, or something like that from Stanford. Listen, we're all on the message boards. We're all looking around. We're trying to pick up any tea leaves we can and get as many studs as we can. They're going to get studs. And whether it's A.J. Store for sure or not, even though it seems like the perfect fit, I, I understand the concerns because he's been bouncing around schools. But this is Terrence Shannon Jr. light in terms of his game. It just seems like the right fit. Now, listen, Brad Underwood's going to get talent. You're going to keep a core around, I would guess, of Amani, Ty, T, uh, Dre Gibbs, Lawhorn, Luke Goody I'd like to see as well. You tell me you got that core coming back with Merez Johnson, who's going to be an immediate impact player, and then you go out and you get scores and you get a big. That's a fun team. Is it a Big Ten champion? I don't know. The Big Ten's going to be wide open next year. It, is it going to be Purdue after they lose Zach Eady and Lance Jones? I mean, they'll be good. You know that. Is it going to be Wisconsin? Hell no. Great guard, man. <sighs> Have fun, Wisconsin. <laughs> what is Max Klesmet going to score 28 points a game? I mean, listen, the guy's a baller in his own way, but you're going to kind of need that if you're Wisconsin. Listen, you're going to be good. The question is, who's going to be on the team? We'll wait and find out, but uh, what a good place to be in for Illinois sports. I'm going to watch the Final Four this weekend unencumbered, uh, not with many what-ifs, because you played UConn. They kind of answered the what-if, didn't they, in authoritative fashion. So I get to watch unencumbered and keeping an eye on the transfer portal and – Looking forward to next year. And no offense to Illinois football, but this is going to be many more podcasts in the month of April about the transfer portal and not spring football. They've, there's been a few things with that program that has pissed me off. I don't even want to think about them right now. I'll get to that in another podcast. We're doing positive things on the 200 level. Okay, a reminder, we have a website, the 200levelpod.com, for all the audio, video, and the new column with the Terrence Shannon Jr. column about his legacy and what's left to be kind of decided on that as this court case continues in May, I try to write this with as much, mm, listen, it's all about the fans' perspective, what I went through, what a lot of you might have went through, watching Terrence and trying to kind of play that balancing act. Um, I try to be fair to him and try to be fair to a fan base that was, come on, we're rooting for our team. What the heck do you want us to do here? And also acknowledge this guy had an absolutely incredible season. He's fun to watch playing basketball. He just is. He's incredible on the basketball court. So that's tomorrow. The 200levelpod.com is where you can find all that stuff. Got to thank DP Doe online at dpdoe.com. State Farm agent Brian Hansen. Brian is my guy.com. Owen Builders LLC. I'm on at owenbuildersllc.com. And Dogtown Heating Air and Plumbing. Get your AC check scheduled at 217 841 4728. For Champion Showers Podcast Network, uh, we will be back probably not, what is it? It's already Wednesday. We'll see if the transfer portal gives us any goodies. Uh, not Luke Goody, but just any goodies in general. And do a podcast anytime there's breaking news, whether that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We'll be around. No trips or anything. So we'll be at your beck and call. And I would like to think that in the next few weeks, we have a much better idea what the roster for next year is going to look like. But in the meantime, everybody, stay dry and stay warm as it snows outside. Barf. And we will see you soon. It is the 200 level. Thanks, YouTube. Went a little bit longer than I thought, but I appreciate you hanging out on this Wednesday evening. On your way out, like us, subscribe, and the200levelpod.com. Check out the website. I think you'll enjoy it. See you, everybody.